Have you ever wondered how successful architecture, engineering, and construction companies scale their business? Or have you ever wanted guidance on how to get more growth, wealth, and freedom from your AEC company? Well, then you are in luck. Hi, I'm Will Forat. And I'm Justin Nagel, and we're your podcast hosts. We interview successful AEC business leaders to learn how they use people, process, and technology to scale their businesses. So sit back and get ready to learn from the industry's best. This is Building Building Scale. Hey listeners, it's Will here. Our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. If you've ever listened to our show, then you know that the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. So if you suspect technology is your weak link, then book a call with us to see where we can help maximize your company's IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. Joining us today is Heather Lennon, the powerhouse founder and CEO of Imagine General Contracting and Development. Imagine is carving out retail spaces and giving new life to historic buildings through adaptive reuse. With over 26 years of experience under her belt and a master's degree that marries retail store design with customer and consumer behavior, Heather is the brain and brawn behind some of Phoenix's most iconic redevelopment projects. Additionally, she leads Imagine Develops LLC and co-manages Arizona Warehouse Holdings, where she manages multi-million dollar projects that not only transform spaces, but communities as well. And that's not all. Heather's passion for cigar culture birthed Rack on Tuse Cigars LLC, offering elevated cigar experiences that aficionados can't get enough of. In 2003, she had a bunch of awards go her way, uh, including the Real Estate Development Awards Redevelopment Project of the Year, Dress for Success's Woman of Impact, and Phoenix Community Alliance's Center City Newcomer. Heather's a proud ally of the LB, LGBTQ plus community, and her contributions go beyond bricks and mortar. She's a philanthropic force impacting lives through extensive charitable work. And with all that said, Heather, welcome to the show. Wow, I sound way better. <laughs> Thank you. That's quite I, an intro. I appreciate you. I have performance I, anxiety you now. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree i think you are way better than that intro a thousand times over the first time we talked i feel like we talked for like an hour and a half on our our first 30 minute call i knew that i wanted to talk to you more and i knew that this was going to be amazing so i'm I'm really excited for this um so yeah let's start off with just the beginning what's what's the origin story for heather and, and tell us about imagine and uh i think when we talked you had six and a quarter businesses that you were were a part of or you led in, in some capacity so let's talk about those as well okay that's a very open-ended question um i uh have basically a um legacy of small business ownership and entrepreneurship in my family for many generations. And pretty much everyone that I'm related to, um, we're all very different, but we all work for ourselves. It's uh, something that we're very passionate about. Um, So I went to college, I went to graduate school, and then tried to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. And eventually, um, I opened a design firm. And then it evolved, and people started asking me to do more and more. So I got my residential and commercial general contractor's license and just kept moving forward. And then eventually um, started uh, two development companies. um, And with that have kind of spurned a lot of other interesting opportunities. And yes, absolutely. I I say all the time that I'm trying to save the history of Phoenix one old building at a time, but uh, it's really important to me to do so. I think that uh, we're such a young country and if you've traveled elsewhere, you see that. And if we, you know, if not us, then who? If we don't save these buildings now, then they are going to be lost to the sands of time. And how unfortunate, because we have some amazing, amazing history here in Phoenix. And I think it's, it's, uh, it behooves us to do what we can do and what we have to do to save it. So, yeah. Where did you get that love and passion for historical buildings? I know we've talked about it a bunch, but mm-hmm. um, take, take us through that. I think that... Uh, just being in the construction and design industry has 
afforded me a lot of opportunity to experience old buildings, um, as well as traveling throughout the country, throughout the world, seeing other old buildings. I have such a great respect for architecture. And I, I think that uh, the history of people is spoken in the architecture, if you just know how to listen. So I, uh, I, I try to be able to tell the stories of the buildings that I save. And they're always, they're interesting. They really are interesting. And it gives us a peek into who we were and who we are. So yeah, it's a, uh, I'm very happy to be able to kind of lend my nuanced skill sets to to being able to do things like this. It's really, really rewarding. So speaking of nuanced skill sets, uh, I think it's important to talk about what your superpower is. Do you want to tell the people kind of a little bit about what your superpower is? Oh, gosh, I, <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that. Um, I, I think that... Uh, I have said it many times. I think that we all have to figure out what our superpowers are and we have to um, do everything we can to use them for good. And that that's what I do. I think I think superpowers are, are nuanced and it evolved and involved. And I, uh, I, I don't know that I could really pick one. Um, and I'm not saying that out of hubris. I'm just saying that, you know, as a person, you know, you have a lot of different uh uh, skill sets. So I think it's just the combination thereof that that uh, allows me to, to get stuff done. And I'm unafraid. I mean, I am comfortable in the role of visionary and one has to be if you're going to get things done. And um, I have proof of concept and I have the ability to, to continue and do more and people behind me. So here I go on to the next building now. You've been really good with reuse and adapting a space to be revenue generating or more revenue generating. What tell, talk about that. Tell us about how, when you see a building and maybe it's a historic building here in Phoenix and you say, Oh, I, I could take this building and we can make some, we can make this to a actual profitable building. Sure. So, so this is how I describe it. I describe it as, you know, the first thing I need to do is figure out what the puzzle pieces are. Right. So I need to find that building. I need to find that space. I need to find that that um, piece of land, whatever it might be. Um, and then I have to figure out what the shapes of the puzzle pieces are. And then I have to put them all together. Um, but then because I've been doing this on the back side of the puzzle with no picture, I have to then flip it over and figure out what the heck the picture is. So um, adaptive reuse is um, in order to save an old or historic building, you cannot just own it. You have to find a way to, for it to be of service to the community. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. But I, I don't think old buildings should just be like obelisks that you look at and admire. It should be something that is of service to the community. And I think that um, providing jobs, ridding the city of blight, um, going into neighborhoods where other people are not interested um, with people that they're not interested in, I'm, I love that. I am, I am absolutely willing and I am most interested in going into those types of spaces. And it is a catalyst for change. I mean, that is how cities evolve. And it's also an invitation for others to join you. So, you know, in one of our development projects, you know, we're very proud to say our new neighbors are uh, the Suns and Mercury. So Matt Ishbia bought two parcels of land next to us in a beautiful old building called Lincoln Union. And we're really happy to welcome him in the neighborhood. And every time something like that happens, it's, it, it brings forth more. So it, it's great to see how it's evolving. And I, I look forward to, to seeing how, what else happens. So, Can you give some other examples of what you mean by sort of adapting a space to produce more revenue? Uh, Cause I think, this really, I think it gives perspective as to when we talk about, like, even when you were describing this to me, you and I didn't think to this extent what you were talking about. So if you could give some examples and how, how mm -hmm. you turned it. Okay. Um, in, in, in finding a building that I want to adaptively reuse, I don't always have um, the, the picture yet. So I don't know how I'm going to adaptively reuse it. But I know that in order to save it, I need to be a steward of that square footage and I need to find the most optimal way for each square foot to revenue generate. 
And, you know, that's something that is my responsibility as, as a, it's, it's a, an arduous process that I, I don't know how um, I have evolved the skill to be good at it, but I have, um, I mean, I've been doing it a really long time, so it's great to be able to continue doing so. Um, and I, I think that, you know, as an example, you know, with the, uh, with our Arizona warehouse holdings um, development company, some of the parcels we bought on the South side of Phoenix, um, one of them was, you know, a kind of nondescript metal building from the fifties. That was a lost leader that really looked neglected. Um, and, um, I was able to very simply refurbish that building and give it new life. And now we have, uh, a, a one tenant, which is our event business, which, uh, leases 2000 square feet for storage, um, and it's liquor storage. So it's something that is greatly needed. Um, and the other uh, portion of the building, um, we are happy to be building out um, a catering kitchen for M Culinary. And they are our partners. Um, they're, we look forward to having them for the next 10 years in that building and longer. Um, it'll be their downtown hub. So they're very happy. And so yet again, that building now has produced jobs. It has produced revenue streams for the people that are you know, selling the kitchen equipment and the people who are, you know, um, getting the ice makers. So all of these things, the trickle down is so significant. And it's not just the people that you employ. It's all of what goes on from that. So it's really cool to, to successfully be able to do those things. Is that helpful? Oh, Very. yeah. Well, you had mentioned earlier that, uh, you you read architecture you don't just see architecture and and say oh this is a beautiful piece of architecture that's gorgeous you read it what what does that mean for our listeners well i think that if you have a a, a good understanding of architecture and how it has evolved over time it it is kind of a, a primer to that reading so um in the in the warehouse that we purchased which um is actively run now as Warehouse 215, uh, the event venue, um, there were, um, I did not save the building. That building was originally saved by Michael Levine. And I feel like I finished what he started. And um, he took it from a, a, a not functional anymore warehouse into something that was functional and saleable. And um, when I bought it from uh, the people that he had sold it to, I was basically... To me, I was tasked with removing all of the bad decisions that had been made in the building. And those were things like closing off rooms and covering windows with, with drywall and having a ton of storage in there and having a walk-in cooler and chairs and pallets and tables and you know unnecessary spaces for its intended use, which ended up being an event venue. So we pulled away all of the bad decisions and tried to expose the bones of the building. And within that was immense beauty. And it is a very beautiful building. And I also had very early on, um, I don't know the event business, right? I'm a builder, I'm a developer. But in order to meet the needs of the event business in evolving that building, I had to find out what those needs were. So very early on, I had some great guidance from people in the industry, and that helped me understand how it needed to evolve. So that was... Um, very informative in how I created this building um, to meet the needs of that business. And uh, some of it is just, you know, gut instinct, things I've been doing for a very long time. I mean, there were two separate patios and I um, uh, took the space in between them and closed it in and, and then combined. So it was contiguous patio space that can be closed off. So there's 9,500 square feet of patio space with a liquor license that's available wow. for rent. That's a great thing for that business to have. You know, we have a 12,000 square foot room, which I call the cathedrals, um, that can hold over 600 people seated with line of sight, um, depending on the size of your staging. I had to learn what kinds of uh, needs a stage would have so that I could provide the appropriate kind of panel that people could tap into to run these large endeavors. So... Every single thing that you do, you, you have to become informed about what you're trying to get to and then just do all the hard things. So 
you learned a lot of different aspects to other businesses and even the ones that, you know, the multiple that you're running, mm -hmm. this is not an easy skill, <laughs> right? This is, a, and this is definitely not something that's just, you're good at it, right? This is learned, learned behavior, if you will. Mm -hmm. How did you learn different businesses um, and being able to sort of manage without being completely turning into chaos? How'd you learn? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think that you're kind of asking two different questions. You know, the, the, the process of learning, um, I, I think that there is no replacing just keeping your head down and working hard and just grinding it out. So for 26 years now, I have been doing exactly that. All different kinds of construction, all different kinds of TIs, all different kinds of retail spaces, um, residential spaces. And, and through that, you just learn. And I think you can have... I think you can have kind of a proficiency, perhaps, maybe after five or 10 years of doing something. But to get real expertise, you have to put the time in. So after 26 years, been there, done that. So there are so many things that I have now experienced that, that I can look at a, an old building with all kinds of things that frighten people. And I am unafraid. Been there, done that. So I think that that allows me to see past the things that perhaps frighten other people to find ways to, because there's, there's a building right now that, that we are going to save. Um, and, um, people are trying to get the right to demolish it. So, you know, it's not something I'm going to talk about in specifics yet, but it's really important that you have people that have these skill sets and, and I do, and it is something that has just happened over time. It's just by, interacting and being in old buildings for such a long time, you really learn, you, you learn how to read them. You learn, I, I, I call it like the building is singing again. So I, I think when you truly, like, it was very cool. So the, the uh, Warehouse 215 was a linen and laundry business. And um, it operated as that in different kind of evolutions for quite a while, I think up until maybe the 80s. Um, and it was something that I felt the energy of the space when I walked in there. And that energy I felt was of all of the brown women that had busted their humps working in really difficult situations to raise their families. This was not an optimal place to work. This was some place that um, was very hot, did not have air conditioning. We were, we were grateful to meet... Um, people who we allowed a family and it was soon after we took occupancy to actually use the space for a um, celebration of life for their matriarch who had passed away. And she had grown up working in that building. So the stories that we heard from that family about that were so um, informative to us. And it, it just reiterated what I already knew that there, these are people working in very difficult conditions. I mean, the, the two main buildings that have these beautiful, beautiful bow truss ceilings, um, first of all, which typically do not last that long, but I believe these have lasted because of the humidity that was present in that space. And they're, they're still in good shape and they, they have been engineered now with steel to, to assist that. But uh, to the, the other thing that's great about those is that they are clear story windows. And if you're not familiar with that, they're basically a line of windows and they go really, really high up in this space, right? So there's the bow truss and then there's these clear stories um, and they have a cable system. Um, that was to try to let the heat out because it was so unbearably hot and there are no other windows that open in that space. So to me, you know, I wanted to do justice to the women that had come before me and I wanted to, you know, acknowledge and, and I did feel I felt like the building was happy that a woman was saving it. <laughs> um, so it, it's just a really great kind of a full circle moment when, you know, a brown woman myself, you know, comes in there and is able to bring new life, you know, into a space that certainly had been being used, but not to its full potential. So it's nice to see that it now is and that people can come and enjoy it. Uh, it's very storybook of you know like the you know it it seems like something that you you'd see in a movie or in a in a in a book where mm -hmm. you have this start which 
um, you know, working certainly working in Arizona in a, a place that doesn't have air conditioning is, sucks. Like it just sucks. There's no other way to put that. I can't um, imagine. That's difficult yeah. work. That is earning your every single dollar. Yes, uh, unbelievably. And then uh, for now, it to be transformed by uh, someone that looks very similar to those people that were um, in that environment is uh, there's something special about that. Sure. And also just the ability to um, bring it back into life and and have it be its best possible use and have so many people and have such a, a, a skilled team of people running that business. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to move on to the next building, but it's wonderful to see how um, something can flourish when you when you provide everything that's necessary to do so. Do you think your upbringing affected how you, I guess, kind of grind out or how you are learning things or how you, how you view things? Or was this learned after the fact? No, I think certainly um, I had the benefit of, you know, the conversations as a child that I overheard at the dinner table were of my parents talking about their businesses. So that is something that is so ingrained in my DNA, so ingrained in in my experience of life that um, I, I think that I am, you know, so grateful to have parents to, who who told me I could be whatever I wanted and who modeled that for me. And having, I think that it is not impossible, but it was much more challenging to be a strong woman if you don't come from a strong woman. And I come from really strong stock and my, my parents are very hard workers. And, you know, I, I lost my father in November and that that's, there's a huge like gaping hole for that. But I also know that I'm so grateful to have a father that was worthy of mourning. Do you know what I mean? So grateful to have been guided in my life by someone like that so that I can continue forward. So, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's something that I, I would say the answer would be both because it was modeled for me so much. And I did, um, you know, when I was in high school, I worked in one of my parents' businesses. And, you know, I, I remember being a child and being in one of my parents' businesses. And it's, it's just what we know. So I'm thrilled to continue that legacy. And I do feel like that is, um, I do feel the, the, the weight of that legacy upon me. And, and, I, and I take it seriously. Sorry to hear about your father, um, but amazing way to look at it. Uh, worthy of some or worthy to be mourned that's um that that hits strong with me so um yeah. thank you for sharing that thought so when you so you have a six and a quarter businesses uh, as we mentioned earlier uh which initially i was like how does one do that how do you keep you know how do you keep everything going forward what, what's your secret to um you know having all these different businesses and all of them still moving forward? Um, I think in general, um, you have to um, accept the role of visionary, which I do. And I'm comfortable in that space, as I said. Um, also, I think that you have to be able to get out of the weeds. So, you know, we've talked about scaling up before. And, you know, for I won't get into specifics because it's so kind of a general sense that when you create something, you have to then be able to pull yourself out of it in order to continue to create. So that's something that, that, you know, is challenging, you know, but it's something that has to be done because I only have so much bandwidth. So I want that bandwidth to go towards the things that are, that are most important. I just want to do the things that I'm great at and I want to delegate everything else to others. And if I can successfully do that, then I can successfully continue to to start new businesses because I bring people into the fold that are great at what it is we're trying to do. And then I let them do it. So I don't know if that answers it, but I think that's just been kind of my model. Um, and I, I'm unafraid and I'm unafraid of working hard and I'm unafraid of for whatever reason, the majority of my businesses are in male dominated fields. And it has never been an impedance to my success. Being a woman, being Jewish, being brown has never been an impedance. But that's not the case for everyone. 
you know, I, I, I talk about, I have, um, one of my businesses, two of them actually have a unicorn as, as the logo, which I love unicorns. So I love that. But, uh, also it's because I don't know other women that do what I do. I, I just don't. And, and that needs to change. So it's important to be out there. It's important to have a voice. It's important to be heard um, and, and to set the example. You know, I want my 17 year old daughter to also know she can be whatever she wants to be when she grows up. And that's something that, you know, is, is a guiding force for me as well. I would concur. My guess is you are one of one. Uh, not many women uh, own a construction company. Less own a construction company and a development company, it would be my guess. Even less would own that and an invents company. And then I assume zero uh, would own then, or one, just you, would own all that and then a cigar company. Uh, or a cigar, that, that to me is like, you just really love playing playing in the boys' uh, backyard, I guess. Or, you know, you love playing with the boys, I guess. Well, I, I think that I, I have chosen to do those things which I am most passionate about, regardless of who the captive audience is. And I think that's exactly how we should be. So I, I thrive in those environments and I'm good with that. And um, I mean, the cigar business is, is, boy, it's a wonderful culture. It's a culture of people who the art of conversation is not lost upon them. Um, we really engo- enjoy engaging. I mean, all a cigar smoker wants is to be welcomed have a place to sit and have the music not too loud so we can hear one another. So, you know, we're, we're thrilled. And again, with that, it's very atypical. I mean, we are, we're, um, I headquarter on Roosevelt row, um, in the uh, 1001 building that Jonathan Vento owns, who's another small infill developer like I, and he's amazing. Um, we have four developers, infill developers that are on the floor with us. So we really love these collaborative. We all do something different. So, you know, I'm the one that that wants to put her teeth in all of the old and historic buildings. And there's people who do a great job at multifamily. And gosh, Jonathan Vento seems like he does a great job at everything. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to be in those spaces. Um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the question you were asking. It, it, it was... Uh... Essentially, you're you're in all the space, all the the traditionally boy spaces, um, but it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to matter at all. Like you seem to no, be successful wherever yeah. you decide it, to put your flag, and it shouldn't. And um, as a woman in those those spaces, you know, I can tell you a hundred stories of how um, you have to have a thick skin and have how you have to do it anyway, um, and but it's kind of par for the course. And, and, you know, many, many years, I remember, you know, being on construction sites and when, you know, an inspector would come in that didn't know me, he would go up to the oldest white man in the room and ask him if he was a general. And it was like, no, it's the woman with the curly hair pushing the broom. (laughs) So I am a full believer that it's only the general who really cares about keeping their space neat. So if ever there's one with a broom, then, you know, (laughs) But that's the no, secret. And it's and it's it's fine. I mean, there were gosh, I, I, I go to construction uh, shows whenever I can to kind of keep up to date with what's going on in the industry. And I mean, there were years where it was just me and the spoke spokes models. There were there just not that many women around. So, you know, I'm OK with that. I am not uncomfortable in that space. And I. Um, I know what it is that I'm doing and I'm confident in that. And all it takes is for someone to have a conversation with you and then they, they take you seriously. And I think at this point, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, that our phone rings all the time. So, you know, we're, we're lucky to be able to pick and choose those things that we're, we're, we're most passionate about working on. And we just do that. We have so... a couple of really cool construction ones coming up. Um, some adaptive reuse. I'll, I'll tell you about one if you want. One I'm allowed to talk uh, about. So I want to ask you a question. Uh, I think it's going to be related to what you're what you were going to talk about. Um, you had mentioned something uh, previously to us, which is um, compressing businesses. It was a term that I had not really heard before, but I liked what you said. Could you tell me? Could you tell us what is compressing businesses and how do you compress a business? 
uh, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> so um, I'm awesome. sure you want repeat it. I'm sure it was wonderful. <laughs> so uh, it was scaling up in such a way that's uh, not a beast, you know, to run in any individual business. And you essentially to allow yourself to run all these oh, different I businesses. See what yeah. So basically, see- I think what, what I meant is that um, I don't have any need for each of these businesses to be massive. I don't need hundreds of employees. I don't need 50,000 different projects going on. I want to do those things that I'm passionate about. So I'm, I've been given so many opportunities, as I can think of in 26 years of general contracting, where, you know, offers to be on a television show and offers for partnership and offers that, you know, none of it interested me. I wanted to just sit and I wanted to just grind out and learn. And I, and I was successful at doing that, but I don't have like visions of grandeur. I I like doing the small, intricate, hard things. So, you know, some of my businesses are, are, you know, there's four or five employees. They're not massive businesses, but we get a lot done and we revenue generate and we, we create jobs and I'm able to, to support people's families. I mean, boy, during COVID, that was never more evident to me than then because of all of the commercial projects that we were doing um, at that point, one of which is, uh, is here on Roosevelt and, and First, which is a beautiful building we were able to save. Um, I was so grateful to be able to still safely work and pay people salaries so that they could buy food for their families. I mean, I felt that so much during that time because there were so many people struggling and, and to be able to continue doing that was, was a really um, humbling thing. So I I think that, uh, you know, the idea of of compression, I, I think it's just like making a diamond, right? I mean, it's that pressure and that time, and then you build excellence. So I'd like to say that that what we build through pressure and time does build excellence, and and I like I like um, being at the forefront of doing that. Love, uh, I love how you put that. Uh, that's awesome. We'll write um, it down because I'll forget. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you're obviously very people uh, centric, people driven. Uh, let's talk about. Uh, what you're doing with uh, Mesa Community College and the partnership you have with them or the connection you have with them. Yeah. So we, we you know, part and parcel of, of my, you know, having that unicorn, you know, because I don't know women that do what I do. I, I want to be um, in front of other women, um, other people that are coming up, deciding what they want to be when they grow up. So we, we have... Um, a great relationship with Mesa Community College. They have a construction management program. They have a women in construction club. Um, we have uh, created a, an internship with them. Um, I've also had an opportunity to speak um, to students at, at Phoenix Community College. Um, I just toured um, South Mountain Community College has an amazing construction program. I was so impressed. Um, they have one of their practice gyms that they have turned into a construction site. They are building home, a home in that to teach people how to do this. It's just amazing what they're capable of doing. So, you know, I look forward to doing things with them as well. Um, I I think that uh, there's so much opportunity to just tell people that this is something that you should think about because first of all, not everyone is slated or meant for college. And I understand that but you can have a wonderful career in the trades and you can make a great living and you can have a lot of pride in the work that you do and you can build things and make things and create things. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to do. So I think that the more women we can get involved in that, the better. And, and not just women. I mean, anyone that has interest in the trades that it's just not something that's on people's radar for some reason. And, and, you know, people, I guess, think, oh, yeah, I want to be a doctor. Let me tell you what, some of my plumbers make way more than the doctors I know. So, you know, I, I mean, there, there's and that's not the only thing to do to work. But at the end of the day, you have to pay your bills. So, you know, that has to be a bare minimum of, of what you do for your career. But, yeah, no, I, I think I, I uh, I'm happy to kind of be the anomaly and tell them that that it's OK. They can as well. How do you find people? essentially because you're 
visionary. How do you find the right people to r help you run all of these different businesses? Because you're obviously mm -hmm. not actually in the day to day, which is the right way to scale, right? You shouldn't be yeah. in the day to day. You should no. be working on the business. You're probably getting business. caught in the weeds. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just how what do you it find is. those people? How do you, how do you find those people? Uh, I, and how I, I mean, am I allowed to curse? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Really fucking carefully. <laughs> 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 um there's always lessons to be learned and and i try not to learn them more than once um but i think that um you know having a knowledge base is really important but um what i have found is even more important is character um i i, I want to hire people around me that believe as i do and hire people around me that are bright that can learn um and I like hiring people around me that are interested in evolving and becoming something more. Um, so I, I think that every situation, every business is very different and it's, it's serendipity how things happen. You know, I think you kind of put that out in the universe and looking for something and lo and behold, I've had so many circumstances where I just said, okay, I really need X. And then lo and behold, like we need it. We need another, um, construction supervisor, right? So uh, if anyone knows of anyone, we're, we're looking actively. Um, and one of my attorneys um, over the holidays sent us pies and they were amazing. And they were hand done by this woman who delivered them herself. And oh, by the way, grew up in the construction trades and has done, <laughs> she's the pie lady. So we're, we're interviewing her. So, I mean, who would have thought getting a pie delivered by an attorney would turn into someone who, yes, has spent years in the construction trade with her family and has done construction supervision and is a woman. So, I mean, there's a hundred stories of things like that. So I really, I, I put it out there and I, I, I let, you know, kind of the energy bring to me what, what will, what will be. And I, I talk to people, right? I am. Uh, I'm very good at finding the people that I need. As an example, um, we had a situation where um, we needed uh, a few more um, subcontractors that were doing casework for us, so cabinetry and things like that. So in doing something like that, I think about how do I find a great cabinet maker? Well, I'm going to go to my favorite cabinet door manufacturer, and I'm going to ask them, who do you like working with? Who pays their bills? Who are regular people, right? Good people, right? Small businesses. And I have two new amazing for years now people from that conversation. So there's lots of ways to find. You, you just have to know where to look, if that makes sense. Um, if you're looking for people and, and I, I try to think outside the box on those things. So, um, yeah, there's all kinds of different ways, but, uh, I, I continue to learn more. So if you have any, any pointers, I'm open. You mentioned that your phone rings, which is always a good thing when you're growing businesses. Uh, that's generally a good sign that things are working out, uh, yes. which may mean that you get to be choosy, right? You, you, you'd mentioned, hey, like, we don't want to do every job. I want to do the jobs I really want. What Absolutely. does a job, uh, when, you, when you get the call or when you, you go on site and you look, what's a job that you're like, I absolutely want to do this. And what's one that you're like, mm, not so much. Um, well, what I will say is that, yes, the phone does ring, and I'm very grateful for that, and, and, and um, I have worked hard for that to happen. Um, so the jobs that we are not interested in, they don't end there. I have a group of general contractors that I am very happy to forward these jobs onto because while they are not for me, it's so difficult to find a good general contractor. At a minimum, I want to give people another option. So I will make those connections. You know, there was a residential project out of town that we were asked to bid, and that was not something I was interested in. So, you know, I connected them with one of my female, one of the other two people I know that are women general contractors. And, uh, you know, they're doing the job and, and they're all happy. So, you know, those things happen a lot. Um, but the kinds of things that interest me are, are things that um, save old buildings, right? I am, I am focused right now. I have kind of uh, put my sights in the downtown Phoenix area, and I'm lucky to have a lot of good stuff going, down, going on down here. Um, an example, um, 
the Hotel San Carlos, right? Isn't that what it's called? Downtown? Not my client, but um, they're doing an $88 million renovation, which is amazing. It's a beautiful old hotel and it needs it. But as part of that, you know, the, the, my new client has, has to leave because they're losing their space to this renovation. So um, it's a great business. It's called Centrico. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful family-owned Mexican restaurant, Agaveria, Mescaleria, I think they call it. So amazing drinks, amazing atmosphere, really loyal customer base. And we're very happy we're going to be adaptively reusing the former U.S. bank branch on First Avenue in Monroe. And it's going to become a beautiful new bar restaurant for them with patios and a lot more space to have more interesting tequilas and mezcals and, and space for private functions and more kitchen space so they can cater. It will allow their business to grow and evolve into what they want to be. And that's a great thing to be able to do. So those are the things that interest me. We have another one that's uh, um, just a coolest story. Um, the woman who hired me, who lives there, um, her, her husband and her young daughter, um, she is the great, great granddaughter of the man who bought this building, which had been built by someone else. I think he bought it in like 1920. Um, they absolutely, we've done research. They're, they're one of the, the very founding black families in Phoenix. And it's so important to tell these stories. Um, and he was a, a bishop and he opened up this home to traveling ministers and they would stay there for free. So we're taking this building back to what it should be, to what he envisioned. And it's going to be a bed and breakfast boarding house and they're going to run it. So that's cool, right? That those are the things that, you know, it's a historic home and we get to evolve it. And what an amazing story to tell. And, you know, because of the success that I've had, I can get the news to come and tell the story. I can get articles written because I, I want people to know how important these stories are. That, to be the great, great granddaughter is, is just amazing. So, um, excuse me one minute, guys. So, yeah, that's a, a really cool story. We have, I mean, there's, we have quite a few other, other, I think we have like eight active jobs right now in my construction company. So they're all interesting like that. So it has to be something I'm passionate about. And I'm very lucky to be able to be picky. And I realized this because there were many years that I never said no, because you just have to ring the register, right? That's what you have to do to grow a business. And many, many years that I, I, I guess I had this feeling that, you know, people don't care if I can physically do it. They just care if I can get it done. So, you know, someone who did not grow up in the trades and become a general contractor, I did not start by being a framer or by being a drywaller or an electrician or a plumber or any of the multitude of amazing people that I have had 26 years of gathering this just amazing team together um, to, uh, you know, kind of create these things. Um, I think that the other really cool thing is that my ability to put all of these puzzle pieces together including the subcontractors that I work with regularly, many of them for many, many years. Um, it, it's something that they also have such passion for what we're doing. They also see the beauty in these buildings and have so much pride in the fact that they're also able to be part of saving them. It's, you know, they have brought their families to these buildings. They, and I think it's great to have pride in what you're doing. And they're wonderful at what they do. And I could not do this without them because I'm not going to fire that drywaller and go hop on stilts and put up those, those, it's just not going to happen. That is not my expertise. It's not what I come from. So I have always had to make sure that my subcontractors were great because I'm not going to pick up where they left off. So I've had to be very careful and picky, but I have a great contingent of subs now. So it works really well. People are like, how are you able to get materials and why? I mean, we turned over two projects during COVID early um, and people are like, what the heck? How can you? 26 years is how, right? I mean, I, I, I 
think that um, it's also really important to be ethical. And I'm sorry to say that so many people have terrible stories about what attorneys and general contractors. And here is my belief. I think that that happens because the knowledge base of the consumer as compared to, let's say, the general contractor is so there's such a vast amount of knowledge that that someone does not possess when you are the end use consumer that there have sadly been many occasions where people are taken advantage of and it happens. And I just, I do not, I do not think you have to take advantage of people in order to make your living. Yes. Should we be adequately compensated for what we do? Absolutely. But you don't have to take advantage of people in the process. So that's something else that I have really looked for in my subcontractors is are people that believe that way as well. I, I want to be a good steward with my money with my investors' money, with my clients' money. That's part of what you are paying me for, is that expertise and is being a good steward with the money that you're spending. So it's something that that I take seriously. Or, uh, so great insights. much there. Yeah, so there's, much there's so there. much. <laughs> um, one, years, guys. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're condensing it down into one podcast. Um, yes. So one, I, I hopefully I get an invite to the opening of the U.S. Bank uh, uh, Cantina. Uh, I, I will be you very excited about that. A, a, a you know an offsite podcast. You know, come talk to me. That sounds like a blast. I'll, I'll be very excited for that. We'll we'll fly Will out from Chicago. Uh, I'm there sure he'll hope it's in the winter months, but he'll come whenever. Exactly. Um, that also, uh, if. If there's only two other women general contractors, we we interviewed Tiffany uh, Sharp, who is uh, out of Phoenix. So if you know who she is, uh, may, or if you don't, there's a, there's your fourth. So look at this. Yeah, there, no. There's another GC. Yeah. Um, Actually, we can name them on one hand. Is crazy. You know, it, it is. It's wild. So, also, we, so we interview anybody across the country, and the amount of GC specifically that are woman um, owned and and ran is so incredibly small it's yeah. it's very it's very wild because it's it's one thing when you're in one location but like if you take all of the united states and it's like we just don't see that many like it's, yeah. it's just there's just not that many very I mean, small percentage yeah i mean you uh uh mentioned that the center city newcomer award which i was very humbled to to get from the phoenix community alliance and you know i had to get up and give an acceptance speech, which is not my favorite thing, but uh, I'm told I'm good at it. So I just move forward. But uh, there, you know, PCA is comprised of about 300 businesses. And, you know, it was a big room of people. And I asked, you know, by a show of hands, how many other female general contractors or developers or general contractors, developers are women in this room? And there was one other woman, Ashley Harder, who has harder development. And wow. it has to change. I mean, just like we talked before, it has to change. There has to be a way in which we can introduce these amazing opportunities for lifelong careers to other women. So I think that that just as a grassroots effort, just being out there, having people see what it is that I do, I, I, I hope that it's helpful. I think you are certainly in, inspiring. At least you are to me. So if if that go, if I don't know what the weight of oh, Justin's nice, Justin. inspiration <laughs> is, <laughs> but it, it... just will Justin also wants to be a female general contractor? That's so. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question, um, <laughs> but yes, I I am very inspired by you. Um, it, it even from like I said, the first call that we had, it was it was very obvious at that point that you were doing cool shit and i wanted to hear more about the cool shit that you were doing like there was no question it. about that yeah. um also we, we didn't ask so uh, how did you get into cigars mm. you know like how, how did that all happen that most people don't think let me open a cigar shop just in general not not necessarily even women women less but like in general most people aren't trying to open a cigar shop yes well um it has been my chosen vice for many years. I think if you don't have any vices, you cannot be trusted, first of all. Um, <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah, because you got nothing to leverage them on. I get that. <laughs> um, but no, I've been smoking for you know a long time other than when I was having babies. Um, and 
I uh, had a building that I put an event venue in, right? And evolved that business. And then I saw all of these people celebrating things. And I thought, I think all of you need a cigar. <laughs> so I was like, ah, all right. That's an interesting cigar business. Cause I was never drawn to the model that is most typical, which is brick and mortar lounge. Yeah. You go in, you get great cigars, great people, great conversation. You sit, work, relax, socialize. That was not something that drew me. There's so many great lounges here in town and I enjoy all of them depending on what part of town I'm in. And it wasn't something that was, uh, I didn't feel a pull towards doing that, but the idea of, um, having a captive audience to sell cigars to, I thought was kind of interesting. So that's how it started. Um, I will say that with every single business that I have been a part of, it has always evolved into something I didn't expect. And you have to be willing to pivot towards that success. You cannot be stubborn about how these things evolve. You have to be open to it. And if you can be open to it, and if you can pivot appropriately, then you will find that success. And I have done so again and again and again. So I trust this process. Um, so that, you know, started out there. And then, you know, we had some amazing events at, at my building and it was beautiful and it's amazing patio. And then I started feeling like, um, just how many different ways can you put lipstick on a pig? So for me as a cigar smoker, you know, I, I, I said, you know, gosh, you know, I'm a developer. I know all these people with these amazing spaces. Wouldn't it be cool if we could like go around Phoenix and enjoy cigars in unexpected spaces? So that's exactly what I did. I pivoted that business and said, okay, um, okay, so-and-so you have this beautiful space. Can, you know, can we do a patio takeover? And uh, we've done jazz brunches and we've done just amazing uh, things that that not only are they very interesting to the cigar smoker, but it also brings business to other businesses. So that is a really important thing to be able to do when you can collaborate with someone. You know, we sell cigars and we welcome everyone to come. 1001 North uh, Central, Suite 202. We have amazing boutique cigars. We love our cigar smokers. And out of town people like gentleman came in yesterday. Um, really nice man. Um, pilot comes here like once a week and he bought six cigars, really good cigars. Um, and you know, but they walk in and they're like, where's this lounge? Where's the place that I go and sit and smoke this thing inside this building. And I'm very proud to tell them that not, not only do I not have a lounge, but I also have seven other local beautiful establishments that are in walking distance from this space that will welcome you to come and smoke and drink and eat and enjoy their space. So those people now get traffic from our customers and it's a great way to do things symbiotic with, with other people. We love, you know, we've done wine pairings with genuine. Um, we do beer pairings with Greenwood brewery. That is amazing. Um, you know, woman owned brewery, woman brewmaster, they're badass. Um, they're wonderful at what they do. Uh, I'm not a beer drinker. I get migraines from any alcohol, but boy, oh boy, did our cigar smokers like that beer. <laughs> so it's great to be able to have our customers go and experience things in unexpected spaces and be welcomed. So, yeah, I mean, that's what we do. And people are so excited. Wait, where are they? Well, go on our website. They're all there. You have links. You can find out where they are. You can look at their menus. They already know you're coming. They know to expect our people and they welcome you. And there's ashtrays and lighters and they put you in a space where you're allowed to be. Now, certainly we don't, we don't smoke inside because that, that's a whole other endeavor. Um, but we're so happy to, to allow this, this business to evolve. Plus, um, I have found that cigar experiences are um, very much um, in vogue. People really like them. And I have started, um, last year I started donating some for charity. And that is a really, really cool thing to be able to do. So I donated a cigar experience last year to Boys and Girls Club, Scottsdale, and it sold for $18,000. 
Wow. And I donated wow. our experience to Dress for Success Phoenix, who I am near and dear to my heart. And they made $40,000 and gave scholarships to 100 women. Unbelievable. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so, That's super cool. I mean, it's just awesome to be able to do things like that. And like this year, um, I, I'm just finishing kind of my, my partnerships with who we're going to donate with. And literally today, we just solidified everything. And we're so excited to, you know, we're doing a cigar experience with our friends at Carefree Spirits, who are going to do a tasting at Arizona Stronghold Wines, who are going to do a tasting. Um, my my, I, we have two caterers that are going to be catering. Um, we have um, live music from our friends with magnificent events. Um, we so we we also have from our friends at Dialogue um, a, 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 a portraiture artist that's going to come, and every single person's going to get a portrait with themselves smoking a cigar, like we want to create these great experiences. And, you know, the ones that we did last year, I told them, I want you to have a great enough time that next year you'll pay double. Right. I want to. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, again, if not us, then who I'm so thrilled that these are things that, that can be of service to these, these great charities and be of help. So it's just another amazing way, you know, using your powers for good, you know, one of our buildings, um, when I moved in there while we were doing our remodel, um, I called Maricopa County Health Services and it was at the end of COVID. And I asked them if they needed any space to do vaccines for COVID. And they said no. And then they came the next day and interviewed me and asked kind of the populations I wanted to serve. And I heard from them a few months later and they were having trouble finding a location to do monkeypox vaccinations. So I'm very proud to say that we've vaccinated over 5,000 Phoenicians in that building. So wow. again, just, it's not that hard. Find ways to be of service, find ways to give back. You know, I mean, it, it's such a, a blessing to be able to be mission focused and not money focused, you know, to be purpose focused and not profit focused. Because when you do things that, that, that you're passionate about and when you can see beyond yourself to help others, the success comes. It, it just does. So I don't worry about that stuff. <laughs> uh, I love to hear your uh, strive for impact and purpose, helping people, helping business, helping charity uh, all around. Um, we're getting to the end of our time now, though. So Will's going to ask you one final question we like to ask everybody uh, before we say our goodbyes. Drum roll. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you were to go back in time 20 years, so that would have been 2024, or excuse yes. me, it's 2024 now. So that would yeah. be 2004. Uh, what would you tell yourself? Um, hmm. Let me think about that for a minute. I'm trying to think where I was at that point. I mean, I was certainly working hard. I think that I think what I would say would be kind of don't be afraid to be a visionary, right? Don't let kind of the societal expectations of you define you. And, and, and I think that uh, it's something that I actually said to myself at that time, I said, there is nothing that someone else possesses that I do not have that would make them successful and not me. I just have to make a decision to be successful. And that's literally what I said to myself in, in, starting a business on my own in my twenties and not knowing. And I left, you know, I had a job after graduate school for about three years. I worked for a very, very smart entrepreneur and uh, I learned a ton from her and, you know, then I was ready to move on. And I, I did, I said that to myself, there is nothing that someone, I have had the benefit of, you know, a great family and great modeling and great education and, you know, a strong relationship. I've been with my husband since I'm 19. So, you know, all of those things, you know, it, it behooves me to, to um, realize the, the kind of benefits that I have and utilize those things to find out what your superpowers are and use them for good. So I did, I think it's, it's something I said to myself and it's something that I still believe. And I have said it to other people as well. I had a really interesting um, experience I, I spoke at the, hmm, 
Dresser Success Women's Leadership Conference. And a woman approached me um, afterwards and we were kind of, the speakers were walking around and speaking to people at the tables just for 10 or 15 minutes. And she said, you know, I really want to start a business and I'm trying, um, but you know, it's so hard. I feel so guilty because I'm not like able to make dinners for my, you know, children the way I was. And my husband doesn't have this ready for him or that ready for him. And I, I don't know this woman. Um, but I said to her, I give you permission to be selfish. I give you permission because here's what happens as a woman, as a caretaker. If you put everyone in front of you, the message that you're telling your children is that you are not valuable because they put you on a pedestal and they think you are all knowing when, when they're young. You're the parent. You're, you are the one that they go to for everything. And if they see you not valuing yourself and not working hard to do things for yourself, you know, and your family, then, you know, they think, gosh, you know, mom knows everything and I don't know anything. I really must not be valuable. You know, there is value in, in, in sharing the fact that what you want is success. And she said she had never heard of it, thought of it that way. And she's now come a few times and like, volunteered her time when we do cigar experiences and it's, it's lovely to see her evolve. And I, I see that um, it's very challenging because there's so many times that women are pigeonholed. There's so many times that women accept unacceptable behavior because they do not have financial independence. So anything that I can do to help women create that financial independence so that they can live the life that they want to live. I live the life that I want to live. I have created the life that I wanted and not many people can say that. And I'm very grateful to have done that, but it's also really flipping hard. You know, this is a lot of work. I miss time with my family. I, I miss out on some of those things, but they understand. And, you know, at, at the um, uh, center city award, I, my daughter was there and I made her stand up. And when I was talking and I said, you know, this is my 17 year old and this is my legacy. And this is um, the next generation of strong women that is going to gather others around her and rise together. So more of that. <laughs> well, cheers to that. Uh, I love what you said. Um, those are words truly to be inspired by. And uh, I hope some, whoever's listening uh, gives you a call and takes you up on uh you know, uh, on that help. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're here and we're available and, uh, I'm happy to talk to people if they so desire and, uh, send um, them those old buildings to save. For sure. If, uh, somebody wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, okay. Well, um, my admins run my world. Um, but, uh, uh, racontouscigars.com, R-A-C-O-N-T-E-U-S-E, cigars. By the way, that, that is a very purposeful statement. Um, a raconteuse is a female story. Female rac. Ah, yeah. so, yeah. And just to show you how sexist the world is, when you look up raconteuse, it says see raconteur, which is the male ah. derivation of that word. So it's, it's everywhere. But uh, no, so raconteuscigars.com, um, imagine develops with an S.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. We are on uh, uh, Instagram. So we're kind of everywhere. So uh, certainly reach out. For sure. I'll drop all of the social links in uh, the notes for us. Um, if, is there anything else you'd like to tell the people before we say our goodbyes? Uh, no, I, I would just say, you know, Justin and Will, I, I appreciate you guys asking me to speak. Um, I appreciate you guys giving me an opportunity to perhaps reach more people. Um, and, uh, I, uh, look forward to seeing what you guys do next. Absolutely. Uh, love it, love it, love it. Uh, listeners, I hope you had as good of a time as me and Will did. I think I smiled 99.8% of this, uh, podcast, uh, that, that in the other, other point too, I was talking so uh, that's, that's the kind of vibe I got going on today. Um, and uh, until next time, adios. Adios. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to Building Scale. 
to help us reach even more people. Please share this episode with a friend, colleague, or on social media. Remember, the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. And our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. So if you think your company's technology pillar could use some improvement, Book a call with us to see how we can help maximize your IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. And until next time, keep, keep building, building scale. scale. <laughs>